And the first talk will be by Alexandra Geiger, who is the John, Wesh, the John Walsh Fellow and Associate Professor of History at Jesus. Her work focuses on the political, religious and intellectual life of the 16th and early 17th centuries. Her current research is on the relationship between the religious and constitutional history of the Reformation period, and she's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And her title today is Elizabeth Knoxford, Crown, Church and University. Dr. Geiger. Thank you, Hamish. Um, can, um, is my screen sharing facility? Yes, work? Great. perfect, Alex. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me move on to my first slide then. So throughout our anniversary campaign this year, we have been celebrating Jesus College as the Elizabethan College. We're really rightly, I think, proud of that particular heritage. Uh, we are the only college to have been founded in Oxford in the reign of Elizabeth I. And we're the only college to which the Queen herself is designated as a foundress. And here is, sorry, I'm doing the wrong, there we go. Here is our, our, our foundation charter. But Jesus has a very different, distinctive historical claim. This college was actually also not just the first college to be founded in Elizabethan England, but it was the first college to be founded in the age of the Protestant Church of England. So Jesus isn't just the first Elizabethan college, it's the first Protestant college in either of the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. And for all of those, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the college history in a, in a second, but our college may not have come into existence without the phenomenon of the Reformation. And even if it had, it certainly would have had a very different history. Now this factor is reflected in the college's foundation charter. Here, the purpose of Jesus College of Elizabeth's foundation is defined as the extension of good literature, knowledge of languages, or all, all fairly kind of commonplace, the common utility and happiness of the realm. Now, I think that's an aspiration that really should be a much stronger strand of the modern conception of the purpose of a university. But it's also stipulated that Jesus College exists to maintain Christian religion in its true form, to support the church of God in our realms from the errors and heresies that confront it, particularly in the form of Catholic religion. The ultimate end of all scholarship is, it says, sacred theology. Now, we can't understand the history of Oxford without understanding the impact of the Reformation on both the university and its colleges. And I should just stop for a moment there because I've just used the term the Reformation as if it was one long homogenous or one homogenous event. Um, historians now speak of multiple reformations across our period. And later today, Sue Doran is going to be talking about a Jacobean Reformation. But for my period, I'm going to be thinking about the specific reformations of King Henry VIII here, pictured in this um, version of a famous portrait called the Allegory of the Tudor Succession, here's Henry, um, where England broke with uh, the Roman church, broke with the papacy, and Henry established himself as supreme head of the church in England in the 1530s. And I'm also going to be thinking about the process though of the erection of a church that was truly Protestant in both its theology and its practice under the young King Henry's son, uh, the rather weedy looking tiny figure in this picture, King Edward VI, who <laughs> despite the kind of um, framing of this picture, uh, his reign is, is far more important to the 16th century and to the Church of England than is sometimes recognized and also, of course, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth herself. Now, the break with Rome and the erection of the Church of England across this long period were a series of highly traumatic, disruptive, but ultimately transformative events in the history of the university. And Lawrence Brockless, in his really very readable and excellent, I think, short history of the university, sums up the age succinctly. He writes, the Reformation transformed Oxford and Cambridge in parentheses into an arm of the English monarchy and the new church of England. 
Dismayingly, he adds, it led to a period of 300 years in which most of the university descended into an intellectual slumber, it's a slightly more contentious statement. And, um, but his chapter on this particular age of the Reformation, uh, of the sort of Oxford's history, he defines as an Anglican seminary. And the chapter deals with the process of the transformation of Oxford into an institution whose primary aim um, was to produce a ministry, a clergy for the new Church of England. And of course, that fits with what we know about the early history of Jesus. Jesus was founded by civil lawyers, but it was also founded with this real concern to provide a clergy that could treat, so preach true Protestant doctrine, particularly for those parts of the Tudor realms, Wales, where um, the Reformation had been slow to spread. And in my own work, which as Hamish has kindly um, introduced, which at the moment is in the broadest sense, I suppose, thinking about the state and the relationship of the state and the church in the Tudor and early Stuart period, I really think that historians don't position the history of the universities and their colleges as centrally as they should. Um, history of the universities is a very important, obviously, sort of strands in the history of scholarship and in the intellectual history of the period. But it really ought to make its way much more prominently, I think, into the history of Reformation and the history of public life. Because medieval Oxford, while it had been a beacon of learning throughout Christendom, it produced some of the finest minds in Europe in Roger Bacon, William of Ockham, Duns Scotus. But it's in the 16th century that Oxford and Cambridge uh, gained an importance to the crown and the state that they simply hadn't enjoyed in the earliest centuries of their existence. And there's sort of two broader factors that conditioned that dynamic. The first was the expansion of the universities over the long 16th and into the 17th century, particularly in the population of the undergraduate commoner. And I'm using the word commoner not to refer to people of a lower social order, but to distinguish them from the clergy and um, from people in religious orders. Um, and the expansion of the laity attending the universities as undergraduates, not necessarily proceeding to degrees, but spending some time there is a really important phenomenon of the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, as having some form of higher education became increasingly important as a path into public life for the laity. Now, this is a really interesting subject and I probably um, talked too much about it already, but we're going to be exploring those sorts of issues about the social and political impact of um, educational expansion in our event in the autumn, uh, and I hope you will all come to that. Today, I want to think about this conception of the transformation of the university into the so-called Anglican seminary and the ways in which Oxford was transformed into this so-called arm of the crown and church over the 16th century. And the sort of period I'm gonna be talking about is taking us from the late 15th century up just into the 1560s really, um, to think about the real context within which Jesus was founded. Um, and the reason, you know, one of the really important frameworks um, and one of the really important reasons why, well, the, the important reason why um, the universities were so important to the crown or became important to the crown was as a result of the implications of the break with Rome and the royal supremacy over the church. Now, this is a, a wonderful picture um, of, uh, it's called the allegory, no, it's not, sorry, it's called the, the King's Bedpost and a wonderful book by Margaret Aston, if, if anybody uh, wants to pursue it further, um, but it's an image of the royal supremacy. Here we have a, an ailing King Henry VIII on his deathbed, you know, <laughs> very unlike the Holbein Henry VIII wearing a, an unusual looking nightcap um, with his finger pointing, and that's illustrating that he's giving the supremacy, passing the supremacy to his son, Edward VI, who is dressed regally in the sort of garb that we'd expect King Henry to be wearing. And this is an allegory of the passing of the royal supremacy of the crown to his son. Here are Edward's councillors, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, and here is the Pope being trampled underfoot and the Roman Catholic clergy beating a hasty exit on the left. Now, this is a very empowering image. And theoretically, the assumption of the headship of the church 
the royal supremacy gave the Tudor monarchs new powers. Um, they claimed that there was no higher authority on earth than themselves. They controlled spiritual as well as political allegiance. But despite these claims, though that sort of mixing of the spiritual and the secular in the authority claimed by the monarchs had the potential also to unsettle the monarchy. It made the question of religious allegiance also one of political allegiance. And it meant that for many of their subjects, those two, um, th those two sort of parallel um, uh, pulls on their conscience became conflicted. If anybody knows anything about the 16th century, you probably know that between 1530 and 1570, large scale rebellions against the crown that were religious in inspiration and opposed these changes to the church were a phenomenon of the period. Um, the Pilgrimage of Grace is the largest such example in 1536, where around 40,000 members of the commons rose up against um, the various sorts of changes to the church that were happening under Henry VIII. And there were lots of other reasons for those rebellions, but the religion is a, the religious changes are essential elements. And so the crown consistently needed to ensure that its subjects were obedient and conforming to the new church. Control of the universities, which were of course a central kind of theological uh, training ground of the, um, of the state, uh, was therefore essential to the success of the reformations. And the ways in which the crown sought to ensure that kind of conformity brought about a lasting impact on the university's structure and governance that still exists today. Now, um, I'm going to, oh, sorry, just before I go on to talk about um, that the main body of my talk, I'd just like to pay tribute to our absolutely wonderful new college history, uh, edited by uh, Felicity, who's going to speak just after me. Uh, it's just beautiful. Uh, it's brilliantly informative um, and it's, fun, you know, structured brilliantly too, so you can dip in and dip in and out and read about the history or read about college treasures. And I think, you know, it's an exemplary work of its kind. Um, and then I want to also pay tribute to the work of Robin Dowell Smith, who is, uh, as many of you know, our college's archivist. Uh, but that's only with one of his many hats on. Robin is quite simply the foremost scholar of Oxford's colleges in our period. Well, not just for the period, but for the whole of the existence of the university. Um, here is one of his many works, uh, the history of university college. Um, and um, I, I've learned an enormous amount about the 16th century from works such as these. You know, in histories of colleges are, you know, they might seem to be slow, slightly parochial or, or of interest to the institutions um, and their members, but actually they tell historians of the broader period, like myself, lots about um, uh, political, religious, intellectual and social change in the period. And I'd like to, I think we should pay tribute to those. And I think uh, general scholars of the period would find more in these sorts of works than they might necessarily think is there for them. Now, I used the word traumatic earlier to describe Oxford's experience of religious change. Without doubt, the most famous event in Reformation Oxford is an awful one, a horrible, tragic one, the fate of the so-called Oxford martyrs, the leaders of the Protestant Reformation of King Edward VI, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, here he is here, uh, preaching his final sermon in the university church and being opposed by Henry Cole, Catholic, and um, Hugh Latimer, chaplain to the king, and Bishop Nicholas Ridley, who are here pictured being executed. And these images are taken from John Fox's Acts and Monuments, and more widely known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I think all of you will know um, the memorial to the Oxford Martyrs um, uh, that I'm sure will feature in uh, Paulina Q's talk later today. Now these events are amongst the most famous and dramatic of the Reformation. Uh, here is Cranmer 
preaching his final public sermon. And Cranmer had recanted his um, uh, Protestant faith. He, he'd signed a kind of confession, he'd signed a sort of um, a, a repudiation of his former beliefs. Um, and before his execution, he was meant to be sort of parroting his, you know, uh, new adherence to the Church of Rome. And, and he didn't play ball. He gave a sermon in which he renounced his recantation and um, declared the Pope the Antichrist um, and then was hustled out to his execution outside of Balliol, allegedly, according to Fox, famously holding the hand that had signed the confession into the flames first. Now, these events become incredibly important parts of Protestant history. But at the time, they were actually great moments of propaganda for Mary Tudor's restoration of the Catholic Church and loyalty to the Pope. Interestingly, the Oxford martyrs didn't actually have any connection to Oxford at all. They'd all been fellows and scholars at Cambridge. And actually, in fact, Nicholas Ridley seems to have refused a fellowship at University College Oxford, um, which was a reasonably poor foundation at the time because there was something more lucrative in the Fens. So Cramer, Ridley and Latimer were taken specifically to Oxford to undergo these sort of, I suppose you might call them show trials, where they were publicly debating with a cream of Catholic theologians. And the whole point of the trials and execution was meant to be a restatement of the faith of Queen Mary Tudor and her Archbishop of Canterbury um, and um, Cardinal Reginald Poole, who was also Chancellor of Oxford. And both Mary and Paul saw Oxford, uh, which had been a far less receptive to the doctrines of the Reformation earlier. Um, they saw Oxford as the potential centre, the theological heart of what they thought was going to be the permanent restitution of the Catholic Church in these realms. And that process of what was becoming a successful Catholic Reformation was cut short by Mary Tudor and Paul's death in 15. 58. However, I have to a certain extent begun in the middle of my um, story. I've started with the most famous event in the Reformation. But of course, even before Martin Luther set himself against Roman Catholicism, the universities were already a vital limb, both of the church and also uh, of the state itself. The universities were increasingly important to the crown um, as my um, very, very much missed um, former colleague Jeremy Cato, uh, really established for the universities in the 15th century. So Oxford and Cambridge were religious institutions, of course, because all fellows and scholars, not commoner undergraduates, were either ordained priests or in minor orders of the church. And actually lots of students would have been members of the religious orders that have been monks and friars studying at the very many inns and halls around the city. And actually pre-Reformation Oxford was physically home to various cells of the religious orders whose members were studying towards degrees and it had a very different kind of physical geography. Most obviously too, the cardinal purpose, even in pre-Reformation Europe of the universities in terms of an active life rather than the evolution of scholarship for its own sake was as a training ground for the clergy. And if we to think about the um, university throughout our period as actually a strikingly youthful place, uh, the, the sense that we have of an Oxford fellow, an Oxford don as, um, you know, an old male in a job for life with <laughs> a pension at the end, or, um, potentially, um, is actually uh, not at all really applicable to our period to the 16th century. Um, many um, people, perhaps the majority of students, came to the university in their mid-teens and um, most of those who did proceed to degrees would move on from the institution to some form of career in the church. And for clergy of particular ambition in the 15th and early 16th century, a university education could be a starting place towards a really astronomically successful career, partly in the church itself, but also within the state. Now, two of the founders of Oxford Colleges in the early 16th century are a fantastic case study in the life of a sort of clerical careerist, that is, a cleric with a university education who wanted to immortalise their great success by creating collegiate institutions. 
Here we have the founder of Corpus Christi College, Richard Fox. Fox was from a yeoman that is a non-noble family in his origins. He'd studied at Oxford, he'd apparently become a Bachelor of Civil Law, and he held a series of bishoprics before being appointed Bishop of Winchester. Winchester was the richest, well, one of the richest sees in Europe at the time, so this really was a kind of plum job within the church. But Fox also had a very important parallel career in royal administration. He was a very important, he was the leading Privy Councillor to Henry VIII on his accession and Lord Privy Seal. And because Fox had this great kind of high office in church and in state, he had the funds to endow Corpus Christi, which he intended to be a bastion of Renaissance humanist studies. Now, more famous than Fox is uh, our Henry VIII's great minister, of course, Cardinal Wolsey. Wolsey dominated affairs in the early period of Henry's the reign after he sort of shunted Fox and his allies out of the scene on the Privy Council. Wolsey's father seems actually to have run a tavern. You can hear him, his, his sort of enemies in, in, his, in his life uh, referring to his very low social origins but he'd been an intellectually gifted boy who had begun his career at Magdalen College where he had been bursar. But from his academic origins, Wolsey had really scaled the ladder of the careerist cleric. He rose within the royal administration um, and with Henry's blessing became Archbishop of York and of course a Cardinal of the Church and chief statesman in England, Alterex of the King as he has been described. Wolsey, of course, immortalised his famous wealth and power in lots of buildings that now seem to be sort of iconically recognised as part of the kind of Tudor century. Wolsey was the original founder of Hampton Court Palace. His palace, York Place, uh, became Henry VIII's greatest palace of Whitehall in London. And Wolsey founded Cardinal College in Oxford, which he intended to be the biggest and richest foundation. Um, and of course, that would be refounded as Christ Church later on. So this phenomenon, the university educated cleric stroke royal minister, was a very common feature of pre-Reformation governments throughout Europe because the educated clergy, of course, had the necessary literacy to perform administrative tasks. And bishops were particularly important in diplomatic roles, which required high skills in Latin communication and also an understanding of the Roman or civil law. And this, this particular kind of aspect um, of, of international diplomacy and the necessary understanding of, of Roman law to do so um, was uh, really one of the very prominent reasons why so many of those who came to be in the sort of higher ranks of the clergy in the early 16th century had degrees within the civil law rather than theology. And actually, um, this is a rather arcane point. Uh, the reason I'm laboring this point is, is interesting um, because one of the great kind of puzzles of the story of the Reformation is why is it that in the 1530s, so few of Henry VIII's clergy, a senior clergy at least, um, uh, resist the repudiation of papal authority and accept the notion that the king is head of the church in matters spiritual as well as matters um, so, uh, jurisdictional. And um, one argument that historians have come up with is that you know, many of the senior clergy um, have been so sort of consumed into rural administration. They've followed these careers where they've got expertise in, in the law. They don't have doctorates in theology. Uh, and that may, has sort of made them a kind of supine presence, um, you know, subjected already to a kind of royal supremacy that doesn't exist in the law, but does exist de facto in reality. Okay, so there was another primary purpose though of the pre-Reformation Collegiate Foundation that we often forget. Um, beyond that of education or training um, to take a role in the church. So, those who founded colleges uh, were also expecting these institutions to pray for their founders and their benefactors uh, and to intercede 
for their founders and benefactors' souls in the afterlife. In other words, Collegiate Foundations, as Clive Burgess has recently told us in a very illuminating essay, they also fulfilled the roles of chantries. And chantries were religious institutions that were meant to channel the grace of God, bring the grace of God down onto this world and speed the souls of the departed out of purgatory into paradise. And indeed, Fox's statutes at Corpus require um, the fellows to pray for not just for his soul, but for the soul of his parents so that it might be speeded from purgatory. And I've gratuitously added some images here for you to look at. Look, medieval, this is, a, um, a, I think, a, a 12th century image of the ladder of purgatory of souls going down or, or scaling up into heaven and here are some souls within purgatory waiting to know their final destination and a king and a cardinal uh, as well as some uh, people of I think that's a tonsured cler cleric. Um, the point is I suppose that we still of course I mean recognize our benefactors in college rituals and events in dinners and prayers for them and so forth but the original theological conceit behind this practice the idea is that prayers and masses for the dead might spring the departed from purgatory was one of the most prevalent doctrines of the medieval period it was also one of the core doctrines disputed in the Reformation and really viscerally repudiated by Protestants as a Catholic fabrication created, as Luther argued, by the iniquity of the Pope. Protestants believed in justification by faith alone, which undermined the notion that any kind of religious rites from masses, prayers to saints, pilgrimages, relics, or even good works of a, a personal kind like charity, uh, which has seen very characteristic of late medieval religious practice could influence the salvation of any soul. So if you're gonna challenge the doctrine of purgatory, you might challenge the purpose of all religious institutions, including the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge um, that had that function as one of their, so had that purpose as one of their specific functions. And, scholars of the 1530s and 40s may have had good reason to wonder if universities were in some form of existential danger that they might not survive the schism with the Church of Rome. That fear stems not least from fear of the ambitions of the brilliant evangelical sympathizer Thomas Cromwell. Now I am a, an enormous admirer, uh, well you know, admire is, you know, too faint uh, praise of Hilary Mantel's uh, stunning uh, trilogy about Cromwell. Um, but I don't remember her stressing one of Cromwell's most important and surprising roles in the 1530s, which was that he was appointed um, something called the vice gerent in spirituals under Henry VIII. And this is actually an astonishing, um, this is an astonishing moment. Um, Thomas Cromwell of his humble origins, uh, who may have been a mercenary soldier who was allegedly a devotee of Machiavelli, was made deputy of the Church of England under Henry VIII. Um, and Cromwell began the process of the systematic policing of Oxford and Cambridge to secure religious conformity that really is the major theme of the Crown's interventions in university life from the 1530s onwards. He issued an enormous royal inspection called a visitation of all religious institutions in the church. So monasteries were visited, cathedrals, parish churches and the universities as well. And his agents were investigating uh, the state of these institutions generally, as well as to enforce the compliance with the break with Rome. Now, of course, the most famous result of these visitations was the entire dissolution of the monastic life in England between 1536 and 1541. And that in itself had an immediate impact on Oxford. Uh, many of the religious orders, as I've already said, had their own colleges and halls and they all disappeared and were usually absorbed into other collegiate foundations. There's also some evidence to suggest that Cromwell and Henry might have envisaged the fate of the colleges and halls of the universities to share the fate of the monasteries, their endowments furnishing the royal coffers further. And certainly, if you'd been a member of such an institution, you might have thought that that might have, was on the cards. Because, but because, of course, the church still requir required to train clergy, especially preachers, and the skills of theologians, Oxford and Cambridge were reprieved. 
And um, Cromwell himself, before his fall, is a recipient of amazingly oily letters from scholars from the universities. You know, a fellow of Christchurch declares him to have the wit of an angel and then asks him for some money. Um, but as the theological centers of the realm, it was also essential that they were made to conform. So in 1535, all officials of both the university and the colleges and the halls were required to swear allegiance to the royal supremacy and to repudiate the Pope. They were also required to abolish the teaching of canon law, the law of the church. And that was probably the most sweeping educational change of the Reformation. Um, in the 16th century. And then of course the universities also came under the particular scrutiny of the king himself. As a symbol that they were under the royal thumb, Henry VIII founded the first set of regius, that is royal of the king, regius professorships at the universities in divinity, Greek, medicine, Hebrew, and civil law. And this is actually um, uh, something that Elizabeth II has recently really revived as a statement of, um, you know, um, there've been a spate of new regius professorships um, for uh, recent landmarks in her own life and reign. Now, the major concern of Henry VIII had really been the supremacy of his church, and, and no historian would describe his church as Protestants, really, in the sense of doctrine and practice. And so it was under Edward VI and Elizabeth I that a thoroughgoing Protestant Reformation was established with, you know, a liturgy in the vernacular, a Protestant liturgy in the books of common prayer that were produced, the outlawing of the mass and Catholic doctrine. And with all of that, the remodeling of churches and chapels as a physical space. And again, I'm using uh, the amazing uh, illustrations from Fox's uh, Book of Martyrs here. Um, this is um, the temple well purged, Fox's image, or the image within Fox of the Edwardian Reformation. And here we have King Edward um, down here, the godly king, King Josiah, as he's often described, um, tearing down, um, you know, idolatry. Uh, and here we have um, the, the, the temple, the church purged of false Catholic ritual and the materials of the Catholic mass. Uh, this is the ship of the Romish church. Um, and this says, you know, um, the papists packing away <laughs> um, and uh, the burning of images. So you can see the burning of vestments, of statues, of um, images of um, all of the paraphernalia of the Catholic mass as the um, interior of the church space becomes, in theory, this ideal, a communion table, a simple communion table with bread and wine in the middle of the church rather than an altar. And I just want to, um, you know, uh, plug uh, my uh, colleague and friend Sarah Mortimer's fantastic website um, called The Impact of the Reformation. Um, also, uh, this is a, a project that she um, initiated a few years ago, which was really to bring home to our students a sense of the extraordinary kind of physical transformation of religious ritual within um, their own lives over the course of the long 16th century. And she got her students from Christchurch um, to dress up and pretend to be participating in these rituals. And, and this is her image of the pre-Reformation church, uh, you know, the, the, the vestments of the uh, Catholic priest, uh, the, the, the um, the incense, uh, and here is a, a parishioner worshipping at a, a statue of a saint. You'll recognise this is the university church. Uh, and here is um, Sarah's uh, reconstruction of a, a much simpler kind of Protestant service of the kind envisaged in the Book of Common Prayer um, under Edward and Elizabeth of communion in two kinds, bread and wine, priest in simpler garments, um, and um, uh, without that kind of elaborate paraphernalia of the mass. Now, during the brief reign of King Edward VI, it seemed as if England was going to be the leading light of the reformed nations in Europe. This moment, that image in Fox of King Edward as Josiah, you know, uh, bringing about the great reformation of the church was a moment of real hope for evangelical Protestants across Europe. And Oxford and Cambridge had the potential, it was thought to be the new, the central universities of uh, an ongoing movement. Religious exiles from the continent were drawn to England in the hope of building this new Jerusalem. 
And two of the most important theologians of the day, really leading lights of the Continental Reformation, that is Martin Butzer and Peter Martin Vermeule, were attracted to reform the universities as Regius Professors of Divinity at Oxford and Cambridge. Now, it's often difficult for historians to know how and the extent to which individual churches were actually conforming to the letter of the law, becoming, you know, the ideal expressed in these sorts of images. Um, we often have to make quite creative use of some very boring sounding documents. Historians of the parish look at the accounts of the parish churches, church wardens accounts, to find out what's happening with the materials of, of, of religious worship. Are they buying more communion wine so people can communicate in both kinds? What are they doing with the traditional vestments and images? And the same is true, actually, for historians of Oxford's colleges. And these, I'm sorry to keep going back to Corpus, but it's a brilliantly documented college for these sorts of questions. These are from, uh, Corpus keeps extraordinary, kept extraordinarily full accounts across the period. Uh, and here you can see the accounts from 1549, uh, where we can see that um, uh, Corpus purchased a great Bible and they purchased the book, the book, the book of communion. Uh, but they also seem to have purchased holy oil and wax. So you can see the kind of hybrid kinds of response to um, uh, religious change that was happening at the time. And in fact, Oxford was not as receptive to the Protestant Reformation as was Cambridge. And Peter Martyr had really drawn the short straw when he became a professor of divinity in Oxford rather than his compatriot Brutzer in, in Cambridge. Uh, Martyr was married, which was anathema to the Catholic clergy. And he had a terrible time at Christchurch. Um, people kept vandalized. They broke his windows, I think, four times. And he had to sort of fortify himself in a stone study. Um, and um, it, it was not uh, um, the easiest time in the life of, of either reformer. I'm going to move forward now to the new, um, to the final part of my talk, uh, to the young church of the young Queen Elizabeth age 25 in 1558. And for Elizabeth, the task of reformation was even more difficult. Mary Tudor's Oxford had largely been purged of Protestants. Cardinal Poole had led a very successful visitation of the university, which had included exhuming the body of Peter Martha's wife um, uh, and, and throwing it on a dung heap amongst other really uh, symbolic statements of the restoration of Catholic orthodoxy. And so the situation looked pretty dire in the 1560s. John Jewell, Bishop of Salisbury, lamented, they've so torn up by the roots all that Peter Martyr had planted. They've reduced the vineyard of the Lord to a wasteland. And he warned the theologian Heinrich Bullinger that he wouldn't summon a dog from Zurich to come to Oxford. It had become such a wicked and barbarous place. And so the dilemma of reforming Oxford in the 1560s, a decade before the foundation of our college, seemed to be an extraordinarily difficult task. The heads of University College, Merton College, Balliol College, Queens, Lincoln, Magdalen, Corpus Christi, Trinity and Christchurch all resigned their positions after the religious settlement of 1559 because they would not take the oath of supremacy to the crown. Nicholas Sander, a former Catholic scholar of New College, crowed that, crowed that visitors had given up trying to impose the oath of supremacy on everybody because they'd have had no scholars left in the university. Nevertheless, vast swathes of scholars did leave the university for exile on the continent or a private life. This must have been an extraordinarily disruptive period for the university. New College lost 33 of its 70 fellows. Merton lost nine of its 14, so it's an even higher proportion of a much smaller whole. And there was lots of other sorts of resistance to the Reformation too. When the Crown tried to impose Protestant heads of house onto Merton and Corpus, the fellows remaining barred the gate against them, just wouldn't let them in. And when individual colleges were visited to see if they were complying with the new changes, the fellows of New College argued that the parliamentary statute that mandated using the Book of Common Prayer was invalid in their college because their own statutes were so much older. <laughs> More prosaically, another fellow claimed to have drunk all the communion wine himself uh, so that the fellows couldn't communicate um, uh, in, both, in both kinds according to Protestant rite. 
And in many colleges, the materials of Catholic worship, the vestments, the chalices, the altar cloths, which were of course, not just, you know, part of the mass, but, you know, symbolic parts of the college. These were the treasures of the college with great emotional investments and they were expensive. Um, they weren't destroyed, and, but they were often spirited away and concealed by scholars hoping that religion might yet again revert to Catholicism. Lots of our information about these conflicts comes from official inspections of colleges by the college's visitor. That was almost always a bishop or a bishop's subordinate. Um, to a non-specialist, it's difficult to imagine a more boring sounding document than an Episcopal visitation record. And yet these sorts of records, these legal records into the college life is the source of some of the most extraordinary kind of insights into the day-to-day -day life of colleges. In the battles of Corpus Christi, Catholic fellows trying to get rid of a Protestant principle they loathed, denounced Principal Greenway um, as uh, having indulged in carnal copulation with eight infamous women, each lady is described, and her, her place of lodgings in Oxford, and drunkenness. They describe him coming back from the town drunk, zooming into the hall and setting himself amongst scholars until one in the morning, tottering with his legs, tippling with his mouth, hearing bawdy songs with his ears as my lady hath a pretty thing. And in the end, drawing to bed, he could not be persuaded that it was yet nine o'clock when indeed it was past two. So from this investigation, which is really engendered by the sort of reformation conflicts within the church that have made the college so factious, we get this extraordinary kind of account of early Oxford drinking culture. The impacts of this immediate disruption were twofold. The first is what we might think of as a brain drain. Some of the most proficient English scholars of the age fled into exile, where they wrote propaganda against the church. They founded seminaries to prone priests for the reconversion of the British Isles. Perhaps the most brilliant scholar in Oxford in the 1560s was one of the most famous Catholic martyrs, Edmund Campion of St. John's, who left a brilliant career in England to become a Jesuit priest, and he led the first doomed Jesuit mission to reconvert England. Others, formally ejected, however, followed a very less dramatic path, and I think we might have a sense of some of this from Felicity's talk. George Etheridge, who'd been Regius Professor of Hebrew, withdrew his official college position, but he continued to hold rooms in the town. He practiced medicine officially, but quite clearly was still tutoring the offspring of the Catholic gentry or those unconvinced by the Protestant settlement, but he was doing it in an entirely kind of informal way. As a result of this sense that the universities were very difficult to police, um, the governance of the university also changed. Again, and became much more closely brought under the control of the crown. Again, breaking with the practice of the medieval period, the Tudor monarchs nominated the first lay, that is non-clerical chancellors of the university. In 1565, Elizabeth's nominee was her favorite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, her rumored lover, who, you know, in film and legend comes across as a sort of flirtatious courtier, but scholars recognize as one of the weightiest statesmen of his day. Leicester took his role certainly as chancellor very seriously. He ended free election of both the vice chancellorship by congregation, but also the heads of houses and halls by their members, who they were given a royal nominee to basically rubber stamp. And the religious complexion of the student body was increasingly monitored and um, policed. In 1581, it was stipulated that all students over the age of 16 hadn't only to take the oath of supremacy, but they also had to subscribe to the 39 Articles of Religion, a statement of pure Protestant orthodoxy. Now, that's a requirement, really, that um, goes beyond any other requirement of doctrinal conformity in the Tudor state. And this is, of course, about the notion that so many people that are coming to Oxford and Cambridge are going to become members of the clergy. And concern about the religious identity of Oxford scholars led to a piece of legislation that persists today. And that's the practice of matriculation, which every student, of course, has to undergo. Matriculation was also a product of the Elizabethan Reformation and the Chancellorship of Leicester, as he sought to ensure that every student in Oxford became a registered member of a college or a hall. You couldn't float around and study in the, Ox in, in, in the university anymore. You had to be formally part of its institutions. Finally, 
the darkest side of state intervention on Oxford is the fate of the forgotten martyrs. The forgotten Oxford martyrs, the Catholic martyrs, who weren't memorialized by John Fox, uh, but are memorialized in, um, I, I'm sure Paulina will probably bring this up later in her talk today, but are memorialized in this very small um, and very underwhelming um, plaque on 100 Holywell Street, which is the site of their execution in 15. 89, two priests and two laymen under the chancellorship of the Earl of Leicester's successor. And I think about this site of the gallows, you can see it's very, uh, very uh, vividly um, set down here, uh, which is just, of course, outside of New College, which had been one of the bastions of Catholic orthodoxy for as long as it could be. And so our college was born into um, a, an institution that was undergoing quite traumatic social, religious, uh, and in some senses, physical disruption. Um, the university was being painfully converted to an Orthodox seminary for the Protestant Church of England. And our college was to play a vital role in the next stage of that process. Thank you. There will be an opportunity after the second talk for questions to be put to the speakers. So can I suggest that people who have questions might like, them, might like to send them to the chat and we'll take the questions to the two talks at the end of the, our second talk, which is by Felicity Heal. Um, Felicity Heal is Emeritus Professor of History at Jesus College, um, an expert on the Reformation and on social history in the 16th century, and crucially, the editor of the recent Jesus College Oxford, the first 450 years, a very good college history, which came out earlier this year to celebrate the 450th anniversary. Um, she's a fellow of the British Academy and of the Royal Historical Society, and she's going to talk to us today about observing the Reformation, the townsmen of Oxford, and the experience of religious crisis. So over to you, Felicity. Thank you very much, Hamish. In the earlier part of the morning session uh, that you have been listening to, there was a great concentration on the problems that Oxford University uh, experienced in the course of the 16th century Reformation. What I was aiming to do in this second lecture is to talk not about the university, but about those who lived and worked in and around Oxford, but who also, of course, experienced much of the religious crisis of these years. Uh, could I have the next slide? Uh, I would begin here, though, with an image from the Oxford Mail, their cartoonist a few years ago, which gives a clear impression, I think, of the degree to which when people think about Oxford in this period, they think almost exclusively about the university and almost all these images that you see on the screen there are associated with the experience of the university. But as I say, it's not simply the university with which we are dealing when we look at Oxford as city and town and community in the 16th century. So what I want to do here is to have a look at how Tudor men and women in the street were expected to behave and perform. And then a little bit about what we know about what they actually did in performance in the period we're dealing with. Were they merely good, dull standers by, led by their intellectual inferior superiors, witnessing crisis and actually not being able to do anything about it? Well, let's think what they were expected to do, these Tudor men and women in the street. Uh, could I have the next image, please? Here we see not an Oxford image, but an image of the first official Bible uh, translated into English, uh, which was uh, uh, licensed by Henry VIII and was made available in the churches from 1539 onwards. Uh, you see this is Henry at the top, uh, giving out the Bible to his clergy and to his noblemen. And then as we go towards the bottom, and could I have the next slide? We see in detail 
what the ordinary people were supposed to do. And here they are, they are listening to the preacher. They are, I don't think you can perhaps see, they also are warned that there is somebody in prison on the right hand end of the picture. And above all, they are expressing their gratitude for the king in his giving of the scriptures. They're saying, Vivat Rex, Vivat Rex, or in the case of the children, God save the king. In a sense, they're given a sort of religious agency, these people, they're allowed to talk about what is happening, but clearly they are dependent on the spiritual and political advice of their superiors. Now, I want to start by applying this sort of image of the people to three Oxford incidents, all of them described by John Fox, the great martyrologist of the English Reformation. Fox was an Oxford man. He came up to Brasenose about 17 in age in 1534, and then he was a fellow of Magdalen from 1538. And he always was interested in the doings of the university. The first of his stories predates his own experience. In 1528, Cardinal Wolsey discovered that he was harboring what are described as a nest of heretics in his new foundation of Cardinal College, later, of course, Christchurch. A group of scholars translated from Cambridge were infected by dangerous Lutheran ideas. The network was uncovered and a dozen men were imprisoned in the college cellars. But instead of immediate trial or demand for recantation, they and others who were mistrusted were made to participate in a grand procession of book burning. Could I have the next image, please? Here we see not that particular procession, but one uh, much later in Cambridge in 1557. But I think it gives us some idea of what was intended in 1528. Fox describes how a great fire was made upon the top of Carfax in the city centre, and a procession formed of men from four different colleges and six monks, and they were made to move around it. These were the suspected heretics. They were made to move around it, and every man was to cast a book into the fire as evidence of their renunciation of heretical ideas. And I think if we go to the next slide, you can see more clearly that that in a way is happening in this later image. Books are being cast into the fire. This is in Cambridge in 1557. And a number of ordinary men and women are standing around witnessing what happens. Obviously in 1528, the target was the university and its scholars, but this was also an example of a public forum which involved the citizens. Carfax was the heart of the town and was situated on the boundary between the territory of the university and the city. It was, and here I use the language of anthropology, a liminal space, and it was one in which former book burnings had also taken place. John Wycliffe's works were burnt there in 1409, and those of the supposedly heretical Bishop Paycock in 1457. The warning was designed to be witnessed by both communities the town and the gown, and it was a warning to both. Fox's second narrative was of an incident he witnessed himself in 1536. He was present in the University Church of St Mary the Virgin on a Sunday ceremony when one John Mallory was presented to the congregation and required to recant his heretical beliefs. In the middle of the sermon, there was a cry of fire, fire, caused as it turned out just by a chimney fire in a nearby house, which spread soot and smoke. There was a fear, however, that the church itself was going to catch fire. Uh, could we have the next image, please? Uh, this is not that same period, but that fear of fire here, the London fire of the 17th century, gives us a sense of how people felt. Fear, uh, total panic ensued in St Mary the Virgin on that Sunday. The doors were blocked by people and it was cried that the heretics had conspired people's death. There were some fatalities, Fox doesn't say how many, but my interest here is really not in the drama itself, but in the comment of Fox at the beginning, 
the church, he said, was crowded because the academics and the students were there, few being absent, but also that a great number of citizens and town dwellers were present, drawn by interest in the recantation. In both these cases, both in 1528 and 1536, I think we see the townsmen as witnesses, but perhaps just as standers by in performances organized by the university. The third set piece described by Fox is complicated. This is following on the crisis of the mid century when there were great debates about the first, the Protestant uh, university under um, Edward VI, and then the return to Catholicism. In April 1554, there was a debate, the second of these debates, and this was between the imprisoned Nicholas Ridley, Bishop of London, and his opponents, who were the leading theologians of the university, William Smith, Richard Tresham, and William Chedsey. The subject matter of this debate was very much at the intellectual end of ideological discussion uh, on the nature of the Eucharist. And the debate in 1554 was really designed to condemn or provide the beginning of the condemnation of the Protestant leaders, Ridley, Latimer and Cranmer. But the interest here is that there was an intention that the people of the city should once again be involved in what seems like a very abstract and complicated debate. Hugh Weston, the Dean of West Windsor, who presided, made a deliberate attempt to make the condemnation of the Protestants understandable to the layman present by translating key passages of the debate into English. It would, of course, have been a Latin debate. Could I have the next slide? Ridley, after the event, uh, com commented bitterly on what had happened, and we see his comment here. He said the disputations were conducted in most contumelous taunts, hissing as clapping of hands and triumphs, more than tolerable, even in stage plays, and that in the English tongue, and to get the people's favour with all, underlining that last comment, the sense that the people are being involved here in something which is extremely contentious and are being pulled in to a degree that would never normally have happened within university and intellectual debate. Could I have the next image, please? The whole story of Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley and their uh, persecution and burning is, of course, very well known. And we have here images that have already been shown earlier in the day. We have Cranmer preaching uh, in Great St Mary's, his recantation, and then following on that, this is very much a clerical occasion, but following that, could I take the next slide, please? We have two examples in the drawings in Fox's Book of Martyrs of the burnings themselves. This one is of Latimer and Ridley being burned, and then one more slide, please. Here we have Cranmer, the close up of Cranmer being burnt, holding his hand into the fire because of his shame at having uh, initially recanted his beliefs. What I was going to pick up here is that although these are great and traumatic debates within the intellectual community of the university, we can see once again how the laity and to some extent, even the ordinary townsmen are pulled in as witnesses, are having to experience the process of reformation. What we see at the front here uh, is Lord Williams, the sheriff and his deputies, but behind we see ordinary men of the town and the city and the area. They are more, I think, in these cases than good, dull standers by. But nevertheless, it is very unusual, not just in Oxford, but in any environment in which uh, the elites of Tudor England are trying to control the laity to give them this degree of agency, this degree of involvement in the process of change. And if we could finally then think about what happens thereafter, 
if we go to 10 years after the famous burnings, that is to say into the reign of Elizabeth, we find we are at the royal visitation of 1566. And at that, we're back to very much the sense that the mayor and corporation on the one hand and the ordinary men, boys and women on the other are now merely part of the background, uh, uh, kept in a, a controlled environment uh, in which loyalty to the queen and order and hierarchy are now the central issues of the day. However, as Alex has already suggested to you, that in the 1560s, ideological conflict in the university was still raw. And we should not, I think, assume that we move from this traumatic violence of the 1550s into an easy world in the 1560s. Right, so, so much for ways in which the town is represented or thought should behave in the context of the Reformation. What I want to turn to now is what we can see about what actually does happen in the town and its relationship with the gown in 16th century Oxford. Could I have the next image please? Here we have the part of the Agas map, the famous Agas map of 1577, in which we see the way in which the town and gown in a way are represented. We see the degree to which it looks as though the colleges are firmly enclosed, are rather separated off from the rest of the environment. Not in the case of Jesus, I may say, which is not really yet in a very, um, developed state, but if we look at Brasenose or Lincoln or the other colleges of this kind, they are enclosed. And we can see that in another way, in an image, uh, could I turn to the next image please, uh, of the colleges, which part of the drawings done for presentation to Queen Elizabeth in 1566, that sense of enclosure and separation, Lincoln College on the right, um, uh, the, uh, I think it's Brasenose on the left. So we have a sense perhaps that the town and the gown when it comes to a number of things, but particularly to religion, are rather separate and distinct, the, the colleges keeping to themselves. But it's not as easy as that, or as obvious as that. Oxford was a small city. It expands maybe from about 3,000 people in the 1520s to about 6,000 in the later years of Elizabeth. And the town was profoundly interdependent with the university. Uh, there were, of course, the officials of the university. There were privileged persons who served the colleges and halls. And there were all the market traders and everything that went with them, which obviously sustained the university. When we look at the religious life of the town, uh, that interconnectedness and that interdependence is also, I think, very obvious. Institutionally, it was the parish churches that bound town and gown together. Oxford was characteristic of many English urban centres in having a remarkable number of parishes. Most of them were quite a large, a small population. In the 14th century, there'd been 19 parishes and only five of these have been made redundant by the mid 16th century. Many of the churches were under the patronage of colleges, just to give one or two examples, All Saints Church uh, was under the patronage of Lincoln, as was St Michael in the North Gate, St Aldate's of Pembroke and so on and so forth. There was one obvious exception, which was St Martin's, that was the very much the city church uh, and was at Carfax, and could I have the image uh, of, yes, this is the Carfax and Martin's church, which was demolished in the 19th century, though its tower is still present. The city church was independent of the colleges, um, and power was much more obviously exercised there by the church wardens who were part of the city. The parishes were generally poorly endowed, uh, that was true of livings in most English towns in this period, but colleges who were patrons might actually provide some quite reasonable um, incumbents for these parishes 
young fellows of the colleges might be promoted as vicars or chaplains, and they could, in theory at least, offer preaching and guidance, which was rather rare in the early modern English parish. Uh, we can find good examples of this. Uh, Robert Wisdom, a former monk and chaplain at All Saints, was radical, and in 1537 he preached to his congregation according to the gift that God had given him and the gospel of Christ. And it was said that he had the support of the mayor of Oxford and went on to a distinguished career in the Protestant church. Or John Jewell, could I have the image of Jewell, please? John Jewell, who was a fellow of Corpus and one of those rare stars of Protestantism in Edward VI Oxford. He was vicar of Sunningwell out in the west of, beyond the west of the city. And every Sunday he was said to walk across the Thames water meadows and up the hills to feed the flock of the Lord. So there were one or two examples of really quite distinguished preaching in the Oxford parishes. And at the other end of the spectrum, we find somebody like Stephen Rousham, vicar of St Mary's Virgin, who fled to the continent in the 1570s and became a missionary priest. And obviously one suspects uh, maintained a degree of Catholic belief before that. Now these congregations were in theory made up of both town and gown, and students from the university were not separated from their parishes. Prayers and daily liturgy were conducted certainly in the colleges, in the chapels, but the expectation, at least under Elizabeth, was that scholars were parishioners. They went to their local church on Sundays and feast days, and they also attended the university sermons, as did the citizens. So there was an interconnectedness between the beliefs and behaviours, one would assume, of the students on the one hand and the town on the other. The parish churches certainly by and large seem to have dutifully followed what was required by first the Edwardian settlement, then the Marian settlement, then the Elizabethan settlement, what was required by law established. When we look at their church wardens accounts, which we can do quite a lot in Oxford for this period, we find that they are doing as they were required to do. They're putting in communion tables, they're taking them out, they're um, uh, erecting the altar under Mary, they're putting the rood in, they're doing the things that were required in law. It would be quite difficult by just looking at the information of the parishes to work out whether there was sentiment in favour of, for example, Catholicism under Elizabeth or Protestantism under Mary. But there are just one or two things that one might pick up, which I think are relevant to the main community of the parishes. One is that several of the churches keep their organs, their music, right through uh, into the 1570s or 1580s, and in some cases, like the University Church, right through Elizabeth's reign. It wasn't that they couldn't have music in the Protestant Church, but any church that was fairly advanced in Protestant views tended to remove its organs fairly early in Elizabeth's reign. And another thing which seems rather unique to the Oxford parishes or unusual in the Oxford parishes uh, is that many of the parishes kept their so-called hocktide ceremonies. And maybe we could have the last image there. This is a survivor or a reviver. Uh, Hungerford uh, it still has a hocktide ceremony. I don't believe it was like this in 16th century Oxford. But the hoptide ceremonies were occasions for raising funds for the parish, allowing the women of the congregation to capture the menfolk with ropes and leave, leave them free only when they'd paid a fine. Nothing, again, that was deeply against the Elizabethan and Protestant settlement, but something that it actually was unlikely would have been maintained in parishes that were of Puritan Protestant sentiment. Then very briefly, finally, I think we should look at what we can tell about the beliefs of individuals or of the town council uh, in this period. Two things I think need to be said. One is that the council remained pretty conservative in its religious views right through into the second half of Elizabeth's reign. 
um, the leadership of the council in the hand of people like Bob Taylor and, uh, and Thomas Williams was uh, fairly uh, conformist, fairly conformist, but not much more than that. Uh, Thomas Williams, for example, one of the ones who was mayor several times, had sons who went abroad to join the Catholics. Uh, and we do find that right through, as I say, into the 1580s, we find examples of actual Catholics being found uh, connected still with the council. That's not to say that there weren't any uh, more Protestant sentiments around. Um, one of the early mayors in Elizabeth's reign, John Waite, uh, was hostile to the celebrations that seemed to be continuing for Queen Mary, as he saw it in the first year or two, he wanted to turn those celebrations over to celebrating the accession of Elizabeth, and that is what he did. So we find the leadership of the council was only very slowly being moved towards a more active form of Protestantism. Uh, though eventually, I think this is quite revealing that it's finally in the late 1570s and in the 1580s that the council begins to recognize whatever the sentiments of its individual members that they have to begin to turn to a support of the Elizabethan regime. In 1579 the council ordered all freemen to attend the sermon at St Mary's and a few years later there arranging to pay a preacher to become a, a lecturer uh, and the people that they appoint in the 1580s are quite strong reformers. And finally in 1579 at the beginning of this process when the council and its freemen are beginning to acknowledge the reality of Protestantism we find a very interesting statement from the council about the preaching of their um, uh, leaders. And it says, so that all estates and degrees within this city might learn and understand their duties towards God and obedience to all lawful magistrates and superiors. There's not very much here about the deity, but I think we can see ways in which that sort of language has come by this time to embody order and civility and duty to the crown. That's not to say that the ordinary citizens have all of them followed in the same direction. We can find examples of Catholic recusancy right through Elizabeth's reign in various parishes. And we can also find examples of those who, if they're not actually committed to Catholicism still, enjoy the rituals and re revels of hot tide, as you see here, of ale feasts and the music of organs. And I think without being able to prove this in detail in all cases, I think we can reasonably assume that much of the citizenry had yet to become in the 1580s even, card carrying godly Protestants. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Felicity, for a quite fascinating study of how the Reformation was perceived by the group one can perhaps call the common people, although with some hesitation. Now, uh, we already have some questions. Can I encourage others to who have questions either for Felicity or um, for Alex to put them into the chat. And can I perhaps begin by asking a question from to which I've been sent by John Wilson, asking, I think this is probably for Alex, saying he went to a King Edward VI foundation school and asking where the money for the foundation came from. Uh -huh. um, so there is a great foundation of grammar schools, um, but not colleges under Edward. And I suppose we just have to think about the fact that Edward's uh, reign is incredibly short, as is Mara's. Um, so, the, I mean, Felicity, do you want to come on this? But um, I think the sort of benefactions of these schools are various, but um, Edward's reign, um, you know, 
abolishes the chantries, doesn't it? So there's that new kind of source of wealth. And the, in fact, the money from that, so the chantries are the sort of foundations that I discussed, they're collegiate foundations that are, are set up largely to essentially to, to sort of pray for the souls of the benefactor. Um, and that doesn't fit in with the um, uh, renunciation, the formal renunciation of purgatory as a doctrine under Wedgwood. So I think a lot of the money for the foundations of those schools comes from that. What do you think, Felicity? Yes, I'm, I'm sure that the, the majority of the direct endowment that is coming, as it were, with the name suggests, directly from the regime itself is, is tr translation across from the chantries into the schools. But of course, there is a, a some of those foundations also have a certain amount of private endowment and that may well have come from the other source, which is the uh, dissolution of the monasteries, the, the buying and selling of monastic lands, which has made quite a significant section of, of the gentry and the um, mercantile classes quite prosperous in this period. Well, absolutely. It's the largest land transfer, isn't it, since the Norman yeah. Conquest? And um, it, it changes the composition of the gentry yeah. um, enormously. So um, all of this has an incredibly important impact on the social history. Um, and I suppose that that also relates to some of the things that um, I was sort of had to cut out in my talk because I was trying to do perhaps too much. But um, and Redwood, um, you know, there is this kind of concern that the um, getting at the end of Henry VIII's reign, there is a kind of draft bill, isn't there, for a, the dissolution of the chantres that looks like it might dis dissolve collegiate foundations and it's not promulgated. And um, Edward's regime confirms the university that its colleges, um, or the its endowed foundations will continue to exist. But, you know, the dissolution of the chantres looks like a kind of moment when that might not have been the case. Um, and you are in a regime that is, the Edwardian regime is extraordinarily, in some senses, I think, imaginative in what it's trying to do. That might be an old fashioned view of things. Um, but um, I, I think that there is a real sort of, you can see um, lots of the colleges at this time squirreling away their property. Um, uh, uh, you yes. know. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the, the colleges, despite the fact that after 1547, they're, actual possession of their uh, properties is, is confirmed at some level, are still very, very nervous because okay. right through Edward's reign, we're yeah. seeing the appropriation of other forms of church wealth uh, going right down to taking everything from the parishes except one chalice, essentially. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, so it's not surprising that I think the colleges must have been very nervous right through this period about their well, maintaining yeah. their resources, as there have been at certain other points in their history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but there were sort of statutes created for the university in Edward's reign that were never actually implemented that would have completely changed the whole kind of framework of um, both the governance, but also the intellectual program of the universities. And um, it's one of those sort of great sort of un uh, unfulfilled um, aspects. Sorry, we're, we're, we're having conversations with ourselves. Um, Hamish, Angela Jackson has a has a question actually. Mm. I, think, too. I, I, I was just about to ask you it. Um, that she mentioned, uh, you mentioned the four Catholics executed outside New College in 1589, and she wonders if that can throw any light on the 1590 inscribed on the royal portrait, which you showed at the start of your talk. Yeah, well, I mean, I share that portrait because I, I think it's the most sort of beautiful and not, not, not seen as much as it should be portrait of, um, of, of Elizabeth. Can it throw any light? Well, um, Sue, is Sue present, um, has the greatest knowledge of the portraits of the period, and I'm not entirely sure that we know um, how and why that portrait comes to Jesus. Um, but um, I suppose what we'd... The relationship is, uh, the, at this point, Elizabeth is being portrayed, you know, in a general sense, Elizabeth is being portrayed um, in this slightly... Um, uh, iconic way um, and um, her government is trying really I suppose as far as possible to unite Protestants and Catholics after the Armada, the failed Armada of 1588 um, together. So do you want to come in on this because you, you've got more, more sense of the um, context of the portrait, I've just seen your you pop Can up. You, am I muted or? No you're not. You're, you're fine Sue. You're muted. No, no, that's okay. No, you weren't. You, you're good. I can hear you. Okay. 
Um, as far as I know, this portrait is in no way a response to the Catholic burnings, uh, the Catholic executions um, that you referred to. Um, there is Protestant imagery in many of the portraits of Elizabeth and the Prince of Elizabeth. But the way that the iconography has been untangled for this particular portrait, it doesn't seem to be there. It's it, it's it's doing something else. It's, I mean, there are different views. One uh, art historian believes that it's about presenting Elizabeth surrounded by um, by plants and vegetation that is all good for health. So it's a kind of presentation of a will for her to live longer. Um, but there are other kinds, but they are much more associated with the more uh, goddess divinity style of um, iconography that you get in the late 1580s and 1590s. That's not to say there aren't other prints that have this Protestant uh, iconography, but I don't think this portrait is one of them. I suppose, interestingly, um, that there is a kind of sense, isn't there, that this veneration of Elizabeth using the notion of iconography um, is disliked by various uh, Protestants um, and some of the sort of ways that um, uh, the notion of veneration of saints is reappropriated. Uh, in particularly in poetry, actually, to talk about Elizabeth, uh, uses Catholic tropes. So this is actually doesn't fit, Angela, actually, with with the notion that um, Elizabeth's Chancellor is, is executing Catholics it is is actually a sort of conundrum. Um, uh, you know, one of the inconsistencies. Sorry, Paulina, were you? I think before Paulina comes in, Robin Darwell Smith has sent uh, something around saying there's no record of how the picture first arrived in the college. Mm -hmm. uh, Paulina, would you like to come in now? Yes, thank you. Um, I think it would be important to clarify that when Catholics were being executed, they were being executed officially for treason, not for their religion. And that's a fundamental distinction that is difficult for us perhaps to comprehend from this distance, but in the period the government was proclaiming that unlike Mary Tudor, who was burning people for their faith, for their true faith, Elizabeth was executing su her subjects who happened to be Catholics as traitors because they were seen as uh, owing allegiance to the Pope and sure. not to the crown. And that's why um, the, the, the plaque that Alex uh, showed, it says that they were executed for the faith. But this is a 20th century construction. Not oh, but it's not though, is it? I mean, also, it's a six, sorry, we're in an internet <laughs> kind of academic discussion, but it's, an, it's also a Catholic 16th century discussion. That you can't separate these things. So no, you can't uh, separate them, but for this audience, I think we need to explain that, that uh, at the time, the, the government wasn't saying we are killing Catholics because they are Catholics. They were very careful to say we are killing Catholics because they are traitors to the state and to the queen. I, I, well, for this audience too, I think that it's very important that people, um, that Catholics also refer to themselves as um, uh, loyal subjects of the Queen who cannot um, support her church and conscience. So for Catholics, they see these issues as, uh, you know, very much um, uh, impossible to separate. And actually, I think many people in Elizabeth's regime recognise that that kind of fudging of, you know, uh, you know, the political uh, and the spiritual is, is, is not helpful for either Protestants or, Catholics, uh, or, or Catholics, and it's sort of a kind of, you know, fig leaf. It, it's, a, it, it's, it's the legal... They that, absolutely see that it's a fig we should, leaf, but, right. is, we should but talk as about an that. alternative uh, interpretation, there about. is the Catholic martyrology as well as the Protestant one. We've only seen the Protestant with Fox. There's a question from Daniel Dipper, which really goes on from this, and I think it's probably for Felicity in the first instance. And she's, um, he's asking, how aware were those resisting religious change, particularly in the form of popular protest to which Felicity referred, how aware were they of the religious divisions and 
arguments within the colleges in Oxford? Oh, so it's a very interesting question, isn't it? I mean, you, you, one, perhaps one goes back to that, almost to that geographical image of closure, the sense that the college uh, in itself, or the university in itself, is separate in many ways from uh, the, the rest of the town and the rest of the society. But I think that's what I was just sort of thinking we need to look, or that perhaps historians haven't looked quite enough at who is present on what occasions? I mean, how is it that people are fed the information or given access to the conflicts? Um, and we don't very often know. I mean, I, I, I make the obvious point, most of the debates, uh, even the most intense religious debates are being conducted in Latin. And although uh, ordinary men and women, some of them, the men, might have some access to education, they're hardly likely to be able to uh, quite get hold of what Peter Martyr Vermigli is actually saying about the Eucharist in the 1549 debates. So I think we have to assume that insofar as outsiders, ordinary laity, or whatever we like to call them, are involved in these things, that they're picking it up very much uh, on the fringes and on the edges, but that in itself is quite important. Of course, by the reign of Elizabeth, and both Alex and I used Fox here quite a lot, uh, Fox makes it his business to ensure that those who feel that they might not understand are made to understand the suffering of the martyrs and hence we begin the whole saga of Fox's work from 1563 onwards uh, which in uh, the following period is supposed to be held in every parish church it's yeah. not just things like the English Bible but the information about Protestantism uh, insofar as that's what I think so. about is, is, is there and is present Christy, I was really struck actually rereading Fox for this um, about how extensively he's using uh, this ability to translate uh, yeah. that really set forth um, the fact that these debates about the Eucharist are totally central to being Protestant um, and how they are an ed educative tool, I think. Yes. In Yes, and of course we should add that, that, that in a sense uh, Catholic martyrology also plays a major role by the end of the, the slightly later period, by the end of the 16th century, in informing Catholics of, of the nature of their faith. So this has become, um, from being at fringe if you like, has become a very central issue in the whole Reformation. There's a, a follow-up question from uh, Dewey, um, saying are, are asking that if a memory of persecution, exile and martyrdom, was it significant for Protestant identities at Oxford during Elizabeth's reign? Uh, it, yes, I, I, think, um, I, I think the memory of um, uh, well, persecution certainly exile is maybe the interesting one of the that that trilogy that is mentioned there um, neither of us touched on the whole issue of exile and and how that might help to form identities and memories but if I could just stick to the Protestant side there I mean very obviously it does so at least amongst the clerical elite um, who are in exile under well, some of them are in exile under Henry, but many more of them are ex in exile under Mary. And that constructs a very strong sense of their own identity. I, I talked about Jewel briefly. Jewel, I think, has that almost beyond any others. I mean, that he is in exile in Zurich and he comes back with a sense of what English Protestant identity is, but also what international Protestant identity is. Um, so I'm just picking up exile there, but I think it's a particularly interesting one of the trilogy. And you can do the same, of course, on the Catholic side, and perhaps even more so under Elizabeth. Well, actually, I was just going to say in the 1560s, that's a great answer. Um, in the 1560s, one of the things I had to sort of cut short was um, the extent to which um, the Protestant scholars, you know, the cream of 
who've really, really been sort of energized under Mary Tudor's church, um, uh, go into exile. And they actually, they haven't got very much to do as exiled scholars. Um, they are, you know, found part of these sort of new educational foundations, or they find other sorts of employment on the, con on the continent. But they, they tend to sort of write uh, works of polemic, but also works of history, um, religious history, that are picking up, you know, the kind of errors of um, all of the kinds of, um, you know, beleaguered Elizabethan bishops uh, <laughs> doing their very best. So Jewel gets into um, a very long argument about his apology for the Church of England with Thomas Harding, who's one of the exiled New College scholars. And, and Harding's got all the time in the world, really, to sort of say, well, you know, this bit of the Bible's wrong and this bit of the Church Father's wrong and your history's wrong here. And poor, poor Jewel, who's also trying to implement the Reformation in his diocese, you know, beleaguered, <laughs> you know, working on all fronts, has to come back and try and answer these intellectual questions. Could put up with Queen Elizabeth as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, yeah. I, I, I suspect we could go on for a great deal longer. But I'm sure that you'd want me to thank the two speakers, Felicity and Alex, for giving us such a lively and informative first session to our day on the Elizabethan College. And um, remind you that you, we'll be starting up again at two o'clock using the same joining details. So thank you all for coming.